All right, welcome back. Today we're going to be talking about increasing perpetuities. And so, so far we have looked at annuities that have payments that change each period and form either a geometric or arithmetic progression. But now we want to look specifically at the present value of perpetuities whose payments form these progressions as well. And so remember that a perpetuity is a series of payments that never ends, right? The payments continue forever. And so because of that, it's only going to make sense for us to look at perpetuities in which the payments are increasing. We're not really worried about decreasing perpetuities because that's not really a thing because the idea of a perpetuity is it goes on forever. And so if you're decreasing every payment, eventually you will hit a payment of zero dollars. And so therefore you're no longer making any payments and so there is a set end to that series of payments. And so it doesn't make sense to look at a decreasing perpetuity, but it does make sense to look at an increasing perpetuity where the payments increase forever. And so that could be a geometric perpetuity where each payment increases by a particular rate R, or it could be an arithmetic perpetuity where you start with a payment of P and it increases by a set amount X every period thereafter. And so we're going to start by looking at how to calculate the present value of a perpetuity with an increasing geometric progression. And then we will look at an increasing perpetuity with an arithmetic progression. Okay, so if you remember when we calculated geometric annuities, we had a four-step process that we went through, and we're going to use a very similar four-step process to find the present value of a geometric perpetuity. And so consider that we want to find the present value of an infinite series of payments, that's a perpetuity, made at the end of each year, starting one year from today. That means we're looking at a perpetuity immediate with an initial payment of $50 that increases by 5% each year with an annual effective interest rate of I equals 7%, right? So it's important to remember here that this is a geometric perpetuity because each payment increases by a certain percent, right? It's not a set amount. That would be an arithmetic perpetuity, but in this case, it's increasing by a percentage, and so it is a geometric perpetuity. Okay, and so our first step here is going to be to value each payment at the valuation date. And so let's start with that. We're going to have that the present value is equal to our initial payment of $50. So we'll have 50. And remember that this first payment is being made one year from today and the present value is valued at time equals zero. And so we're going to multiply by the present value factor to the power of one. And so then our second payment, we will have plus 50, but now this payment's going to increase by 5%. And so we need to multiply by 1.05, right? If R is equal to 5%, that would also be 0.05 in decimal form. Then we multiply our payment by one plus that rate R. And so we have one plus 0.05, which is 1.05. And then we need to multiply by the present value factor squared because now this payment was made at year two. And so we need to bring it back two years to time equals zero, which is where the present value is valued, right? We are valuing each payment at the valuation date, which is time equals zero for a present value of a perpetuity immediate. And so then we could continue to add more and more payments, but I'm just going to write one more here. We will have plus 50 times 1.05 squared times the present value factor cubed. And so that would continue on indefinitely, right? This is an infinite series of payments, which is what makes this a perpetuity. All right, and so we are done with step one. And so that takes us to step two, which is to factor out the first term. And so if we move on to step two here, we will have that the present value is equal to this first term pulled out of all of our other terms. And so we will have 50 V times one, right? If we pull 50 V out of this first term, we are left with just one. And then we will add that to this term after 50 times V is pulled out. So this 50 is gone, but we're still gonna add this 1.05. So we'll have 1.05 and we're pulling out one of these present value factors. And so instead of V squared, we will just have V. And then our next term will be 1.05 squared times V squared, right? We pulled out this 50 and we pulled out one of these present value factors. And so we're left with this quantity squared and the present value factor squared. And so this would still continue on forever. All right, and so that's the end of step two. And now we can move on to step three, which is to rewrite the remaining factor, which is this right here, as an infinite geometric series. And so the whole point of pulling out that first term was to create this factor here that is a geometric series. And so if we move on to step three here, 
we will have that the present value is equal to 50 times v times the sum from k equals zero to infinity, right? This is an infinite series of terms, and we are summing up 1.05 times the present value factor to the power of k, right? So this infinite geometric series represents this factor right here. They are the same thing, okay? And so then we're ready to move on to step four, which is to solve. And so in order to solve this, we need to know how to calculate the sum of this infinite geometric series. And so we know that the sum of a geometric series from k equals zero to infinity of some value m to the power of k is equal to one divided by one minus m, right? So for this series right here, m is 1.05 times v, and so we can rewrite this geometric series as this sum of one divided by one minus 1.05 times v. And so that's what we will do for step four here. We will have that the present value is equal to 50 times v times one divided by one minus 1.05 times v. And so now if we clean up our work here, we can solve for the present value here by rewriting each of these present value factors. And so we'll have that this is equal to 50 times one divided by one plus the interest rate, which is 7%, right? So I is equal to 0 0.07. And so one plus the interest rate would be 1.07. And then that's gonna be multiplied by one divided by one minus 1.05 times this present value factor, which is also going to be one divided by 1.07. Okay, and so then if we plug all this into our calculator, we will find that the present value is equal to $2,500. And so that is the present value of this geometric perpetuity. And so what you're going to find with these calculations is that they are all going to be very, very similar. What will end up happening at the end of each calculation is you're gonna have whatever that first term was in your original series from when you valued each payment at the valuation date, you're going to have that first term multiplied by one divided by one minus one plus that rate R times the present value factor, or you could think of this as being divided by one plus the interest rate, right? If we go over to here, you see that we have 1.5 divided by 1.07. And so we can sort of create an adjusted process here that is only going to be two steps to save us a lot of time. And this two-step process is going to work for any geometric perpetuity. And so here is that adjusted two-step process. The first step is the same. We still want to value each payment at the valuation date, but then step two is just to solve using this formula right here. The present value is equal to that first term, which in this case was 50 times the present value factor, divided by one minus one plus the rate R, divided by one plus I, the interest rate. And so like I said, this is going to work any time that you have a geometric perpetuity, assuming that it is a perpetuity immediate. If it's a perpetuity due, then you just need to multiply this by the accumulation factor, one plus I to the first power. That's all you would have to do because a perpetuity due is just valued one period later than a perpetuity immediate. Okay, so that's all you would have to do if it's a perpetuity due. But in most cases, it will be a perpetuity immediate that you are working with. And so this formula is going to work just fine. Okay, so that's how we find the present value of an increasing perpetuity with a geometric progression. But how do we find the present value of an increasing perpetuity with an arithmetic progression? Well, that's what we're going to look at next. Okay, so if we wanna find the present value of an arithmetic increasing perpetuity, we need to consider this timeline right here. Let's say we wanted to find the present value at time equals zero, so that would be right here. That is where this present value is going to be valued. And we have an initial payment of P at time equals one, but then every period afterwards, it increases by an amount X. And so how would we find this present value of these series of payments that increase with an arithmetic progression? Well, what we're going to do is split up these payments into two series of payments. And so let me show you what I mean. Instead of just looking at this single series of payments where you have P and then P plus X and then P plus two X and so on, what if we just had one series where every payment was P 
so a regular perpetuity. And then we had a second series of payments starting at time equals two of x, and then at time equals three, two x, and then that would continue on forever, just like our other series of payments, right? So this is still the same series of payments from before, but just split up into two separate series. We're still paying p plus x at time equals two, but we just have them split up and we're still paying p plus 2x at time equals three, but they are also split up like our previous payment. And so why this is helpful is now we could calculate this present value by finding the present value of this regular perpetuity with payments of p, and then add it to this second series of payments where it starts with x and then increases by x every period thereafter. And so what formula does this series of payments sort of remind you of? Well, remember when we calculated the present value of an annuity immediate, where the payments formed an increasing arithmetic progression, we used this formula right here. And so we can use this where n is infinity to represent this series of payments right here. And so let's go ahead and write down our present value equation here. And that's going to include both of these series of payments. So we will have that the present value is equal to the perpetuity where we have a payment of p every period. And so that's going to be p times the present value of a perpetuity with an interest rate i, right? This is just our notation for the present value of an annuity, but where n, our number of payments, is infinite, because that's what a perpetuity is. And then we're going to add that to x times this notation where n will also be equal to infinity. And so we'll have capital I A parentheses, infinity bracket I, and this will represent a perpetuity where the payments increase by X every period forever. All right, but we're not quite done yet. We still need to multiply this by something because notice that this series of payments starts one year after the other series of payments. And so since this notation is assuming that we are calculating the present value one period before that first payment, we need to multiply this by the present value factor to the first power, right? And so by multiplying this by V, we are bringing back the valuation date of this increasing perpetuity of this right here, right? One payment period before our first payment, and we're moving it to right here, right? So now this is valued at time equals zero, which is the valuation date of this present value that we are trying to calculate. Okay, so then we know what this is equal to, right? We know that the present value of a perpetuity is just going to be one divided by the interest rate. We learned that in a previous lesson where we talked about perpetuities, but we do not know what this notation is equal to, right? We know what it is equal to when n is finite, it's right here, but what if n is infinity? Then we're going to have to look at this equation in a different way, or more specifically, we are going to have to look at this equation as n approaches infinity, we are going to need to use a limit because we can't just plug infinity into these two parts of this equation. We need to see what happens to this equation as n approaches infinity. And so if we clean up our work here, we're going to take a quick side trip where we look at the limit as n approaches infinity of this equation, right? So we're going to be looking at the limit as n approaches infinity of a double dot n bracket i minus n times v to the power of n divided by i. And the first thing I'm going to do is rewrite this notation right here. We know that as n approaches infinity for this equation, this is just the notation for the present value of a perpetuity due. And so that would just be one divided by one minus v, or we could write it as one divided by d, the discount rate, right? This is the present value of a perpetuity due. And so that leaves us with just two values of n that we need to look at as they approach infinity. And so we're not really worried about the denominator here. That's just going to be i. It's not affected by the limit as n approaches infinity. And the same with this term right here. One divided by d is not going to be affected by this n approaching infinity. And so let's isolate this part. Let's just look at the limit as n approaches infinity of n times the present value factor to the power of n. And then once we figure out what this is, we will come back to this limit right here. And so if we wanna find this limit, let's first start by rewriting this present value factor to be what it is equal to. And so we would have that this is equal to the limit as n approaches infinity of n divided by one plus i to the power of n, right? The present value factor to the power of n is just one divided by one plus i to the power of n. And then notice that this limit in its current state is in an indeterminate form, 
right? If you were to quote unquote plug infinity into this n and this n, you would have infinity in the numerator and you would have some quantity to the infinite power, which would take it to infinity, right? It would just keep getting bigger and bigger. And so we have the indeterminate form of infinity divided by infinity. And so what we're allowed to do here is use L'Hopital's rule, which says that we can take the derivative of the numerator and the denominator, and then we can continue on with the limit from there. And so that's what we'll do here. We will rewrite this limit and have that this is equal to the limit as n approaches infinity of the derivative of n with respect to n. And that's just going to be one, right? The derivative of n to the first power is just going to be one. And so then how about the derivative of one plus i to the power of n? Well, we're going to need to remember one of our derivative rules that the derivative of some value a to the power of x is equal to a to the power of x times the natural log of a. And so in this scenario, if we're going to take the derivative of one plus i to the power of n with respect to n, our value of a in this case is one plus i. And so we'll have that the derivative is one plus i to the power of n times the natural log of one plus i. Okay, and so now we're almost done here. Now that we have used L'Hopital's rule on our limit here, let's see what happens as n would approach infinity. And so now we only have one n left within our limit here. And so what's going to happen to this expression as this n gets larger? Well, as this n gets larger, we're taking one plus i to a higher and higher power. And then we're multiplying it by the natural log of one plus i. Either way, this whole denominator is getting larger and larger. And so remember that when you have one divided by a larger and larger number, that value will get smaller and smaller and approach zero. And so what we can conclude here is that the limit as n approaches infinity of n times v to the power of n is equal to zero. And so if we go back to this limit right here, we can say that this is equal to one divided by d minus zero divided by i. And so now if I clean this up here real quick, we can now go through and simplify this to its simplest form. And so this is equal to one divided by d divided by i. And so then we can continue up here and that would be the same as writing that that is equal to one divided by d times one divided by i, right? If you treated i as a fraction of i divided by one, dividing by that fraction would be the same as multiplying by its reciprocal, which would be one divided by i. And so then one more step here, we know that the discount rate when we convert it to an interest rate, we know that d is equal to i divided by one plus i. And so if we're looking at one divided by d, that's the reciprocal of d. And so if we flip the numerator and the denominator of this and substitute it in for one divided by d, we will have that this is equal to one plus i divided by i times one divided by i. And so that would be equal to one plus i divided by i squared. And so what we just found right here is what this notation is equal to. And so we can replace this notation for this formula and then we'll be able to calculate this present value. And so then we will continue our work from earlier. And so what we will have is that the present value is equal to P times one divided by I, right? That's what we said that this was equal to. And that will be added to X times that expression that we just found, which was one plus i divided by i squared. And then remember, we're still multiplying that by the present value factor, and so we'll have one divided by one plus i. Okay, and so then if we're going to simplify this, notice that we have one plus i in the numerator here, and one plus i in the denominator over here, and so those are going to cancel out. And so what we will have here is that the present value is equal to p divided by i plus x divided by i squared, and this is the present value of a perpetuity with an increasing arithmetic progression, given that P is your initial payment and X is the amount at which each payment thereafter is increasing by. Okay, and so this is the formula that you want to remember. This is a very nice formula that you can use. And so if you wanna see some example problems where we use this formula, as well as calculating geometric perpetuities, feel free to check out our examples video that I'll have linked at the end of this video, as well as in the description below. If you have any questions, feel free to leave them in the comments. But if you don't have any questions, this is all I had for now. So I will see you next time.